Well, good morning. I'd like to welcome you to another edition of our Anchored in the Word Morning Reflection. We're back in 1 John chapter 4, and now we're looking at verses 16 to 19. So if you have a Bible, I'd like to invite you to turn there, and we'll go ahead and read it together. 1 John 4, 16 says this, And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Now we come to the passage, I want to give you a simple summary statement and then we'll get, get into some of the contents here. The following section of John's letter reminds us that the clearest mark of a transformed life is a growing love for God and others. And that will result in confidence when we stand before him someday at his judgment seat. So in this passage, what we're doing is we're kind of going from a discussion we had earlier in the week where we talk about a balanced view of the Christian life, where we have the experiential side, we have the theological side, we have the historical side of the Christian faith. Now we're going to talk about is how a healthy Christian life manifests itself, how it basically produces a transformed life. And so John's going to talk a little bit about that. And there are several facts that we find in this text that really flow out of this concept of a transformed life. The first of those facts is that genuine conversion involves two critical components. Notice what it says. We know and have believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. Notice how he talks about knowing God's love and believing in God's love. In other words, these two aspects that he's talking about are the experiential knowledge and the theological knowledge. Experiential, in other words, I know experientially that God loves me. I've heard the gospel proclaimed to me. I've, I've embraced that message. And I actually have this sense based on how God interacts with me in this world. I have this sense that God loves me. There's an experiential aspect to that. But it's not just the experiential side. There's the theological side. They believe the love that God has for them. In other words, when the gospel message comes, I'm convinced of it. I say, yes, in fact, God does love me. And so I embrace that message and I trust in that message. So genuine conversion ex involves both a theological trusting knowledge and an experiential knowledge where I actually feel that God indeed loves me. We look at a second fact in this passage. Genuine conversion is going to change us fundamentally. He says, he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. In other words, there is this connection between conversion, fellowship with God, and then the result of Christian love. These three concepts cannot be separated from one another. If I'm fellowshipping with God, that means I have to be a genuine Christian. If I'm a genuine Christian, I'm being con compelled because I have a new nature in Christ in the presence of the Holy Spirit. I'm being compelled to walk with God. If I walk with God as a new creature in Christ, what's the result? It changes me fundamentally. So these three aspects are inseparable, and we see that, that dynamic in this passage. We see a third fact. Fellowship with God will ultimately result in a growing love. When we talk about love, we shouldn't look at love simply like we look at a picture where it's just a stationary thing. We should look at, at love very, uh, very similar to the way we'd watch a video or a movie. It's something that's changing, it's growing, it's developing, it's maturing. So when he talks about our love being perfected, he's talking about the fact that this quality of Christian love matures over time. The word perfect being used here means that it's being made mature. And this maturing in our love is connected to the interaction that we have with God. In other words, when I walk with God, when I grow in a knowledge of him, when I'm growing in depth and maturity in that relationship with God, he produces in me the result of that walking relationship will be a maturing love. We then see a fourth fact that's extremely important. A healthy walk with God will give us a steady view and confidence of the judgment seat of Christ. Now, when we talk about God being the ultimate judge, we need to recognize that in the Bible, there are really 
two different judgments that are referred to. One is called the Great White Throne Judgment. And this is a legal judgment. God is sitting on his throne and he will judge us eternally for our sins if we've rejected the gospel. Because we've not accepted Christ's offer of salvation, his righteousness, his forgiveness, because he took our place on the cross, if we reject that, we will stand at the judgment seat of Christ. And God will determine the just degree of punishment we will receive for all of eternity. In other words, the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne are different. But when we talk about the judgment seat of Christ, we're talking about the Christian who's not going to face God's legal wrath because Christ bore his sins and was punished in his place, and he's been forgiven and he's been declared righteous. That believer is going to face an evaluation. When we talk about the judgment seat of Christ, we're, see, we're talking about a time when Christ will evaluate whether or not we've been faithful with the resources that God has given us. Have we managed our stewardship effectively as Christians? In other words, while we won't face his just wrath, <clears throat> we will face his evaluation and service. And so you might ask, well, what's the point of that? Well, the point is that God wants to reward those who've been faithful, and he wants to give them eternal responsibilities. When we talk about our eternal state, we're not simply just going to be in heaven singing praise to God forever. There'll actually be work, there'll actually be labor that we'll do. There'll be an administrative function in that eternal state. We will actually be involved in labors in God's eternal kingdom. And the scripture doesn't lay all that out specifically so that we understand it, but the Bible does talk about the fact that we will have some responsibilities of management forever. This is part of what God created us to do, to be managers of his creation, to be managers of his resources. And so the judgment seat of Christ is about God determining what we will be doing eternally as redeemed creatures living in his eternal kingdom. What will be our rewards? What will be our responsibilities? That's what the judgment seat of Christ is all about. And the fact is that as we live our Christian life, we are either going to anticipate that day with fear and trembling, or we're going to anticipate that day with tremendous joy and excitement, recognizing in faithfulness in this life, God gives me opportunity forever. And so he says, how is it that a Christian can look forward to that day with anticipation, excitement, confidence, rather than fear? Well, here's the answer. Walk with God in a healthy way today. If you'll have a healthy walk now, then there are things that are going to be going on inside of you that are going to change the way you think and look at things. It's going to change what you do. It's going to change why you do it. And ultimately, what it's going to do is it's going to put us in a position where we're being faithful and we stand before Christ. That day will be a day of reward and blessing. Here's how he puts it in the text. He says, this is that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. He's not talking about having this arrogance. When he talks about boldness, he means a steady, settled confidence. Because I know God's character, because I've walked with him, because there's a healthy relationship, when I stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, there's boldness. There's confidence. I know him. I've walked with him. And now he's going to say, well done. I have that confidence. When he talks about a maturing love, he's saying this love is something that flows out of a healthy walk with God. And as we walk with God, what does that do? It pushes out fear. The judgment seat of Christ should be a blessed day for the Christian, not a day of fear and terror. So how can we make this passage practical? Like, what are the truths that are in this passage that will help us today? Let me give you a couple of simple thoughts that I hope will encourage you. The first is this. If you're a Christian, then walk with God. And walking with God and knowing him personally should be your highest motivation. <clears throat> there should be nothing in this world that gets between us and our walk with the Lord. That should be the highest priority we should be motivated above all else, thing, all, all else to walk with God. That should be our highest delight. 
The second practical thought that I have is this. If you're walking with God, then this walk with God should be shaping and will be shaping how you think, what you love, what you're becoming. That's what this passage is really emphasizing. We will be transformed into the kind of person God wants us to be if we will walk with him, if we will abide in him. Three, this walk with God more than any other factor in this life will prepare us to meet Christ at his judgment seat. It's not so much about what I'm doing, but what I'm becoming, because what I'm becoming will determine what I do, and it will determine why I do it, and it'll determine whether or not I do it consistently or not. In other words, the emphasis of this passage is not what I do, but what I'm becoming, because what I'm becoming is the root of what I do. And so this morning, as we think about this passage, I hope that it'll have been a challenge to you I hope that as you think about it, it will more than anything remind you that the clearest that the clearest mark of a transformed life is a growing love for God. And this love for God is something that is rooted in and flowing out of a healthy fellowship with the Lord. Let's walk with the Lord this day. Let's spend time in his word. Let's spend time in prayer. And let's pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ who we interact with on a daily basis that they will have a healthy, growing walk with the Lord as well. If this has been an encouragement to you today, I hope you share that. And uh, let's be out together for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to spend a little bit of time in the Bible today. Help us to think deeply about these things. I pray that we would be transformed people as we spend time with you each day. Bless each person that's listened to this today and those that will later. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I hope that you have a wonderful weekend. We'll look forward to catching up with you uh, the next time we're together. And uh, if you're a member at Anchor Baptist Church, I hope we'll be able to see you this Sunday. And we're just looking forward to a wonderful Lord's Day as we gather together for, for worship and prayer. Have a great day. Bye now.